Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to this panel discussion on European defense, industry, finance, cooperation, mechanism, challenges, and perspectives. <laughs> uh, in the wake of the European Council on February the 1st, the last February, where 1. billion euros were uh, made for the European Defense Fund, our focus are intensified on fortifying, fortifying Europe's defense capabilities. Notably, the Commission has accelerated its efforts addressing the delicate question of our Defense Industries Foundation. The European Commission proposed on March 2023 a legislative framework for the European Defense Industry Programme and the proposal encompasses key initiatives. Firstly, the establishment of a Defense Innovation Bureau in Kiev, coupled with a Ukraine's active participation in European Defense Program. Secondly, the introduction of quotas for the defense industry mandates a minimum of 40% joint equipment purchases by member states by 2030. As we embark on today's discussion, let us collectively explore the means to overcome challenges and eliminate the path forward for robust, collaborative, and secure European defense. We have the privilege today of welcoming a distinguished panel of experts to discuss the critical theme of European defense in all its facets, from industry to finance, cooperation, mechanisms, challenges, and perspectives. We are privileged to welcome Erika Kurochkina, <laughs> Vice Minister of Economy and Innovation of the Republic of Lithuania, responsible for the defense industry and innovation policy. But first and foremost, and for please, from the European Commission, would you please begin our discussion today on the European Defense Industrial Strategy or EDIS? This work? Yes. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all. And thank you very much for inviting me to present uh, the, the, the recently adopted joint communication on the European Defence Industrial Strategy, uh, which was adopted by uh, the Commission together with the High Representative Head of the European Defence Agency on the 5th of March, so last week. Um, this is the first ever industrial strategy that was adopted at European level to propose a vision and some measures to support the competitiveness, but also what we call the responsiveness of the defense industry of the European Union to adapt the, the industry to the new challenges of security that we are facing since the aggression uh, of Ukraine by Russia. So this strategy uh, has really as an objective to, as I say, support the competitiveness, uh, but both uh, looking at the demand side and at the supply side. On the demand side, what the strategy says is that we should invest as European more, better, and European, and together. This is, uh, I would say, the demand side. The second uh, work strand of the strategy is how to support uh, the ramping up and the increase of uh, defense manufacturing capacity in Europe while continuing to invest in innovation and in the development of future defense technologies and products. The strategy also points out to the fact that we need to mainstream defense matter in our public policies at EU level, that we make sure that all the EU policies are also supportive to the competitiveness and the uh, resilience of the European defense industry. And in that context, we are um, touching upon the issue of access to finance that we discuss also during the day. And finally, the strategy is also very clear on the need uh, to work closely with Ukraine and to continue to associate Ukraine in our programs with the, and also the need to work with, uh, with our partners. I will um, maybe give some elements of each of the, uh, I would say, five pillars of EDIS. 
uh, on the first pillar on, on investing more, better, together and European, what the um, Commission together with the High Representative is proposing is to continue uh, in the same vein as we did with the EDIAPA program, um, to put the EU budget on the table, to incentivize member states to cooperate in the procurement phase of defense products and technologies. The idea being that we, uh, it, it's very inefficient in terms of also public spending, but it also, also has very detrimental effect on the structure of the European defense industry if member states continue to work on a pure national ba basis and do not cooperate when they want to uh, launch um, acquisitions programs. And it's very important for the industry to have some visibility to be able also to invest and ramp up uh, its manufacturing um, possibilities. And finally, it's also very good for interoperability, but I, I will try not to, uh, to get, be too, too detailed on that. So one really uh, focus of the strategy is how to incentivize member states to collaborate. We are not imposing any quota. We are putting on the table incentives, being EU budget, also, we try to facilitate cooperation. We propose the creation of, of new legal frameworks that would really facilitate cooperation because we know for a fact that cooperating in, the, in defense is complicated, takes time, and very often member states you prefer to work alone because it's easier, even if at the end maybe the results uh, might be different. So what the commission, the, the really the, the position of the commission of the high representative is to propose, and this is what EDIS does, a certain number of a mechanism being use of EU budget or um, a facilitation mechanism to induce member states to work together and also, and this is very important, procure for the Europe, from the European defense industry. Because we have seen after the um, 2022 that there was indeed an increase in defense budget in Europe, also an increase in the investment into equipments by member states, which is I think very welcome and needed, but a lot of these investments went to industry outside of the EU. And we consider that the defense industry is a, a fundamental part of our uh, defense and our security, and it's important for member states to continue investing in the European defense industry. That's why we, we don't impose quota, we are put, uh, simply identifying targets to try to indicate where we should go because we need to reverse the trend that the majority of equipment in the last two years were bought outside the EU and we would like that more than the majority of equipment is bought within the EU. So I think that you have a double objective, cooperation and buying from the industry to support investment into the competitiveness and the responsiveness. So that's on the demand side. But we also want to support our industry that was tailored for peacetime and they need to now adapt to the new situation. There is an increased demand and we need to make sure that it is competitive and for us we understand that as able to deliver on time and in volumes. And so far the, 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 the industry was constrained by underinvestment on the side of member states, what we call the dividends of peace. But we need to realize that the situation has changed and we need also to help our industrial bases to ramp up and increase in manufacturing capacities. And here again, we propose to put EU budget on the table to de-risk investment by industry. Usually, you know, industry only start to invest, well, I, I generalize a bit, when they get orders from member states. So we ask them to anticipate because we are ready to put EU budget on the table to de-risk the first investments. We also want to uh, put in place what we call a security of supply regime within the EU that would allow to make sure that the industry gets access to the components, raw materials it needs to ramp up its production. And this issue is very important because you can ask uh, defense industry to increase their manufacturing capacities if they cannot benefit from components, raw materials, all the elements they need to uh, deliver on the products, it will also delay the availability of products. Uh, so these are types of um, elements that we put on the table and uh, we will also, um, I would say, uh, translate this and we have translated that in the proposal for a regulation that will now be negotiated by the co-legislators of the European Union, namely the Council of Ministers and the EP, and we hope to have a, a new regulation at the beginning of next year so far, uh, the regulation uh, is coming with a budget of 1.5 billion euros, but we hope also to get additional financing because the regulation is also uh, um, wants also to, su to support the adaptation and the 
uh, also the ramp up of the Ukrainian defense industry. So we really want, and that's a novelty, to associate uh, Ukraine to our efforts, and we also are looking for additional funding to be able to do so. So that's really on, I would say, demand, supply. I would just also add that it's not because we focus and we have focused over the last two years on the questions of availability in, term, in terms in volumes that we should uh, forget about investing into the future. So it's very important that we sustain our investments in defense research and development. In the EU, we have the European Defense Fund. For this, next, uh, for this current multi-annual financial framework, we had a uh, budget of 8 billion euros. I think it's important that we sustain this effort in defense R&D, in collaborative defense R&D. I mean, I think the, the really the, the, the main principle behind EU initiatives is cooperation. Uh, and also the strategy is uh, putting a lot of emphasis on the next MFF, they need to have a, a sufficient funding for a new EDF and also for innovation and to be able to benefit also for the innovation potential of uh, uh, SMEs and small uh, mid caps everywhere in Europe. So that's also a very important point of the strategy. Finally, let me conclude on the mainstreaming part, and, and, and this is something we have uh, discussed during the day, the issue of access to finance. I think the EU has shown that it has put EU budget on the table. Member states have increased their defense budget, but we think it's not enough really for, to have a resilient EDTIB, because EDTIB is also composed of a lot of SMEs, small mid-caps that need financing. And we have uh, commissioned a study that shows that these are the actors in the defense industry that have the most difficulties to access funding, in particular, in particular equity funding. And this is why we are calling on a um, structure, dialogue, and engagement with the financial sector to see how we can actually lift certain obstacles to access to finance. We are, of course, uh, pointing out to the uh, European Investment Bank, which has a uh, exclusive policy, how we can work with the bank to improve the situation, because I think this issue of access to finance as the issue of access to skills and resources is also crucial if we, have a, if we want to have a responsive EDTIB. So I will stop here because otherwise I will be too long, but I think in, in essence it gives you an idea of where we want to go in Europe. Uh, I think it's important to recall that the Commission, uh, together with the High Representative, is putting solutions on the table. We are not prescribing things to member states because member states remain competent for their defense policy, but we are trying to facilitate cooperation and incentivize a more investment in our common industry. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, maybe later we'll talk about the last declaration of Thierry Breton about the 100 billion euros necessary. I mean, it's another debate, but maybe later. Um, Erika Kurishnova, Kurishkina, excuse me, I'm sorry. We are very pleased to follow your point of view um, about challenges and prospects for European defense in Lutiana, maybe uh, in the order uh, to uh, uh, make some uh, more information about what we know from the European Commission. What are your perspective, prospective from your Lithuanian point of view? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Probably I will talk more about the expectations which we have uh, uh, in, in the link with the uh, European defense industry program, strategy, and etc. Well, in my opinion, uh, it's a, a big opportunity uh, for small countries uh, because the principle of EU-made uh, defense uh, uh, products uh, is uh, something uh, which is extremely important for such small countries as Lithuania. I, I will give you an example. For example, last year we had the European Commission had a SAP uh, program, which basically was uh, directed to the big players, big European players, and smaller companies from the smaller com uh, countries didn't have an opportunity to participate and get the funding uh, for the production lines, uh, for the equity and uh, uh, other things. Uh, so uh, what is planned in uh, a European defense industry program is a big opportunity for SMEs. In Lithuania, probably the biggest part of our economy consists of uh, SMEs, and the access to finances is also uh, a big issue uh, in Lithuania as well. So we have a lot of expectations uh, that this program 
system will help us uh, to be uh, a part of European defense industry, a competitive part of European defense industry. Uh, also, it is important uh, for the security of supply chain. Another principle uh, which is uh, uh, mentioned in European defense uh, strategy, uh, because small countries usually have uh, uh, niche competencies. Uh, niche competencies in components production, uh, which are important uh, to uh, big players, big uh, players from France, uh, Germany, uh, Italy. So it's also for us, uh, also we have here a lot of expectations. Uh, what is also important for Lithuania is the possibility uh, uh, more actively to participate in various RNG, joint R&D projects. Uh, well, it's probably not a surprise that Lithuanian defense uh, industry is focused on more innovative solutions. So that why, uh, that's why that innovative part of defense industry strategy for us is extremely important. Uh, also, uh, for me, is interesting how uh, you will, how European Commission will work uh, uh, with a European Investment Bank and other financial institutions, because they have quite a um, reserved or balanced point of view uh, towards defense industry. Maybe they are more flexible uh, in sense of dual use technologies and talking about uh, more traditional uh, military equipment. Uh, th their point of view is extremely different. So that will be very interesting because for our country it's uh, also very important. Uh, also, uh, probably uh, the idea of uh, uh, higher intensity of interconnection among the countries uh, in the sphere of uh, joint uh, procurement, joint acquisition processes is also uh, something uh, uh, what uh, for small countries is important. Uh, and talking about new legal framework, uh, I don't know a lot about that, but what we feel in Lithuania, that for example, uh, the directi directive on guns production is quite conservative. And in our opinion, in Lithuanian industry opinion, it uh, uh, doesn't respond uh, to the uh, modern uh, tendencies, modern geopolitical tendencies. So we hope that um, European legislation will be more uh, flexible and it will be easier to uh, work um, uh, with, um, uh, with uh, all European partners in terms of uh, uh, selling, exporting and, uh, and uh, etc. So probably Lithuania has uh, lots of expectations uh, for that uh, program, but in my opinion, uh, finally, uh, European Commission started to think about defense industry as a normal uh, econom uh, economy sector. So it's, uh, it's, it's really great and it's uh, great to hear uh, that uh, after two years of war in Ukraine, we are finally thinking not about the uh, political discussions, how to ensure uh, our security in the documents or various strategic plans, but how to ensure our actual practical uh, defense capabilities. So. So thank you for European Commission and all representatives for that uh, step uh, you've made. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. <laughs> Maybe later we could go further talking about aid of, aid of states or maybe you have some things to explain to our investors here. Uh, but first, uh, Thomas Mura, please, a program director of the Kazimir Pulaski Foundation, in other words, Warsaw Security Forum. Would you please present a, a point of view from Poland about the European cooperation in defense? 
Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, let me start maybe with a more general observation. I, I would say that, uh, that the advan any advanced uh, military and industrial cooperation needs to start with common threat perception. And actually, uh, before uh, February 2022, it was not always the case. Actually, uh, from the, the point of view of, of Poland, Baltic state of, of Rom Rom or Romania, uh, you know, the, the Russian invasion against Ukraine uh, they have, has not uh, come out of, out of the blue, and it was not about protecting, you know, Russian-speaking minority, but was it was clear continuation of Russian long-standing standing policy. I'm that recreation of the of the uh, 19th century style empire with the buffer zone and so on and so forth. So Russian oper Russian invasion was was continuation of such actions like uh, the Russian aggression against jo against Georgia, uh, first uh, Ukrainian invasion. Uh, the, uh, and, and illegal annexation of Crimea, and uh, uh, the huge armed forces modernization uh, pro, uh, armed forces modernization program GPW 2020, which was basically aimed at building offensive capabilities in the Russian armed forces. So, based on that, Poland announced its uh, uh, the change in its doctrine. It was called Komorowski Doctrine from the surname of our president at that time, and we we have uh, started build. Uh, you know, uh, the armed forces which uh, should be prepared for full-fledged, uh, you know, war uh, in any kind of contingency on the on the NATO eastern flank. And actually, uh, you know, when when the rest of the Europe was still focused more on the kind of, uh, uh, you know, out of area operation. So, so basically we changed this approach. We, we, uh, we adapted after Poland joined to NATO in 1919 when our, our armed forces was ba basically focused on such capabilities like long range transportation, uh, wheeled IFVs, uh, the, the, the lighter capabilities which, are, which, which were useful in such operation like Iraq, Afghanistan, but maybe not in, in any kind of contingency in, in Central and Eastern Europe. However, However, we change it, and uh, uh, we uh, the, since uh, the 2014 we uh, we uh, started to build a, poly, a kind of A to A D uh, the system our own anti accessory adenia, and we increased the number the number of the troops uh, in, in the armed forces. So point was was basically uh, focused on the on the heavy capabilities. We launched very ambitious uh, the armed forces modernization programs uh, like air defense, uh, mechanized forces. Arm, armored forces, uh, new uh, generation of frigates, and, and so on and so forth. And actually, after after February 2020, uh, you know, those programs only accelerated. So, uh, uh, based on our Home Loan Defense Act, uh, as you, some of you probably know, Poland increased its defense spending to 3% of GDP last year, and this year is 4% of GDP. So it's W that NATO NATO agreed in, in Newport, and still some uh, NATO countries. Uh, uh, have problem with uh, the reaching uh, reaching uh, to, so um, uh, yeah, we are very serious about about our our uh, uh, our development of our armed forces. So so right now, uh, Poland decided just after February 2022 uh, to procure uh, 116 M1A2 Abrams tanks used from the Marine Corps. 250 new tanks, uh, M1A2 Abrams tanks, and uh, 180 Korean K2 tanks. So, so just after after invasion of Ukraine, Poland decided to buy 500 tanks. So it's more tanks than than I believe France and UK have together. And actually, it's not not then because we we need to we would like to to buy in total around 1,000 tanks. So so we have more 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 mine battle tanks than than all the major European countries ca countries do. Together. We decided also to procure uh, uh, 32 F-35 uh, fighters. Uh, uh, we are working right now on the procurement of uh, around 600 MLRS, Hymas, and, and Chumno Korean, Korean long-range precision fighter, and 96 uh, Apache, uh, Apache AH-64 Apache, so, so we will be the second biggest user after US, US Army. 
So, so basically, basically, Poland uh, have like uh, huge uh, uh, needs when it comes to uh, military modernization. We, we plan to build really strong, long, strong land forces, and actually, there is a problem. It, we are accused that that we prefer, you know, external uh, providers of, of equipment like United States and Korea. But actually, actually, the problem is that uh, that uh, you know, in Europe, we we decreased dramatically our capacity when it comes to industry. Industrial productions. So basically, because of our our geography, we are we are you know neighbor with uh, both Ukraine on uh, which territory it's it's war like like now, but but also with Russia due to Kaliningrad Oblast. So uh, Poland basically uh, has no time to wait for you know like. 10 years or 20 years to be provided with the certain capabilities. But uh, so in South Korea, there was only capacity, you know, when it comes to industry and available equipment, which could be, which, which could be provided, provided quickly. So, so it was the reason, reason why we, we decided to buy some equipment, equipment external. But it doesn't mean that, that we, we, we would be able to, to buy, uh, procure, or develop together some, some capabilities in cooperation with, with other, other, other European states. The second issue, uh, the, from one point of view, it's, it's that, uh, you know, uh, the, for, from our point of view, uh, the basic security guarantee in Europe is it's NATO with, with the American contribution to, to European security. So, so basically also because our geography, we, we don't would like to see any kind of situation that, that any version of European autonomy, European sovereignty can undermine strong transatlantic bonds because you know you saw that after after Russian invasion of Ukraine it was United States who was a first provided Baltic states uh, the Poland with certain capabilities parachute uh, uh, units uh, the patriot batteries and so and so on so forth so, so we still consider US guarantees as very credible so 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 we, we definitely would like to keep strong US presence in Europe as long as is possible I, I we know of course know that there is some challenge also connected somehow to, to U.S. elections in, in November, but nevertheless, un, unless, until it's possible, we would like to have have a U.S. in Europe. So, so we definitely support European cooperation in terms of industry, military capabilities. But, but we, we would don't don't like to see you know this cooperation to be uh, you know like kind of push Americans uh, out, out out of Europe uh, uh, thing. And uh, this, uh, last but not least. Uh, Poland also is, uh, as you know, uh, is very active in, in supporting Ukraine. So, so we, we uh, in total, we sent around 300 tanks to Ukraine, mine battle tanks to, to Ukraine. Uh, the certain capabilities, including helicopters, uh, fighters, and, and, and so on and so forth, which need to be also replaced soon in our, our armed forces. So we, we come back to the question of the, of the industrial capacity, capacity in, in Europe. So, so it's, it's a major thing. And and uh, last question. I know that I uh, just yeah yeah. So it's it's um, it's that uh, you know uh, from uh, it's not only from Poland perspective. I believe from from our Lithuanian friends and and, and in general Central and Eastern Europe, that that in any kind of European armament industry cooperation, we would like to be treated you know on the equal basis. So so I, I give you an example. So so basically. Poland wanted to join to European Mine the Battle Tanks program you, you uh, uh, launched with, with Germany a couple of years ago. And actually, you know, uh, our government was informed that, that you know, it, it will be difficult, but you can wait, you know, a couple of years and buy ready product, you know, uh, soon. So it's also a reason why we decide to rather go to Americans for the ready, you know, um, uh, operational uh, battle proven products that went 20 years for, for European my battle tanks without, you know, any economic benefits from, from this project. So, so if I believe if our partners from, from European Union would like to have, uh, you know, uh, Central European countries more engage more active in, in industrial cooperation, you know, basically uh, the, our industry need to be also, you know, allowed to join to the certain products at the very beginning, like research and development, uh, designing phase, uh, not, you know, uh, just procuring uh, the ready, ready, ready to go products. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we could later go further with um, 
your new relation with the new ally, the new Swedish ally, mm -hmm. maybe later, because it can compensate your, your American ports. Um, Claude France Arnoux, um, you are a former diplomat, you're a former chief executive of the European Defense Agency. You moderated the panel this morning. Could you please, in a few words, talk about the public and private banks facing the challenges of the growing European defense industry uh, in search of innovation and all these perspectives and perspectives? We can imagine, please. Uh, thank you. I think there is no doubt uh, that in the context of war on the European continent, and I would add several threats of major amplitude all around and for the future, then we need a strong European defense industry. Um, because I say that just after the former presentation, I would like to, to say a word about why should we do we want a European industry and a European defense industry? And why do we care so much about the funding for this European industry? Um, I, I don't want you to, to enter into a political di discussion here, but you may be convinced that to make sure that we keep the transatlantic alliance and security strong, uh, the only solution is to buy American. Uh, I was EDA chief executive, and I must be that the main support we had at that time when I was at uh, EDA chief executive was the support of the Pentagon. And the Pentagon saying that the most you can do and show as European you do, the more support we will get from Congress to have budgets and to have budgets to support uh, the Europeans in their security. Well, it was uh, 10 years ago, perhaps more than 10 years ago, I don't remember. Um, but I think it's still strong. And I will take another example, because I think it's it at the heart of what we can do with our European defense industry and European defense ramping up, or ramp up, as the Commission says. I take Galileo, it were, and that you know very well, because Patrick was, a, in, a, in a way, a father of Galileo. If you take Galileo, at the origin of Galileo, the Americans didn't want Galileo at all. Well, you are not, well, we have GPS, it's all fine. You are not very serious people in Europe, then if Galileo's signal is compromised, what are you going to do? Then it's not a very good idea. When I, after EDA uh, was in the well, envoy for uh, uh, space, uh, some space issues, I went back to the Pentagon and to the National Security Council. And they considered that it was a very important uh, duplication because it was safety to have two systems. Then I really think that if we have a proper dialogue with the United States, we can both continue to have a cooperation, including for some of the, of the member states with uh, procuring out of, uh, of the United States. And for some missions, we know that there is no alternative, for instance, a nuclear mission for fighters. But uh, at the same time, and I think it, it is a reinforcement to our alliance with the United States, uh, have a strong European industry. Then it comes to my issue to fund properly uh, the European defense industry. We didn't discuss this morning in, a, we had a, a kind of technical discussion between experts on, on this question of investment. We didn't discuss public investment because, uh, well, it was mentioned uh, by Madame Faure just before, by Anne Faure. Uh, we have a significant and huge increase in public financing national financing, the defense budget, and you mentioned, for instance, the example of Poland, but most members said if Germany does 2% of its uh, gross national budget uh, in product in defense, it will be a game changer in European capabilities in defense. Um, then public at the level of national states, and of course, what the uh, EU supports with the numbers you have mentioned and with the expectations for the next uh, multi-annual uh, uh, financial framework. Uh, but we don't know how much, 
but we know it will be much more than we have together, hopefully. Um, what, what we discuss is private financing, because it's really key. And private financing from banks and private financing from funds. Um, two years ago, there was a big emotion in the, uh, amongst uh, particularly uh, industry players that some regulations such as taxonomy or ecolabel could damage the access of uh, defense industry to uh, private financing. What you said, uh, what you wrote, in the, in the communication of the Commission is very clear that there is no uh, EU role or planned, uh, I quote, or planned EU uh, rule uh, that would imp uh, impede private investment in the defense industry. And I think it's very important, again, two years after all this emotion about taxonomy and about the, the consequences of different uh, rules, at uh, EU level. What is also important is to make sure, and I think it's important for each of our member states, including here we are in Paris, to make sure that there is no national uh, regulation that would play a negative role vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the private uh, sector. The feeling this morning, and, and I think it's a feeling all around that at least in France, it would be, but you know more, because there was an interesting study from the European uh, Commission by the by the Commission uh, about private financing. Uh, I think a, a significant progress has been achieved vis-a-vis -vis banks. Also because a systematic dialogue uh, is now ongoing at national level. For instance, in France, uh, both in the Ministry of Defense, of uh, Les Armées, uh, and in the banks, you have a kind of network of référents uh, I don't know how you say that in English. Ref referent uh, well, or contact points of uh, uh, able to, to discuss the question and even enter into the detail of a case of a SME that would not get its credit and see why. Is it because it is defense frightening the investor or is it because there are some problems in the file that has been presented to the bank? Then that is a dialogue that has been fruitful led at national level and led at the EU level, EGA, European Defense Agency level, and uh, the, the commission in the communication proposes to extend even more uh, this dialogue. What remains are the funds, the private fund, equity funds for the fonds propre, uh, for, for equity, for the equity. And here uh, there is a lot to do, then ex expectation was coming that from the EIB that going beyond what they do presently, uh, particularly on dual use, uh, going directly to the, to the defense sector would uh, give a very positive signal. It's, it's not a per se only that it would change the game, but it would be a game changer uh, by the signal it would give to, to the investor that there is no, it's not a disreputational uh, a sector and that it is part of peace, prosperity, and including that we discussed also this morning, including in the way that defense, defense industry, defense operations are uh, making a significant effort to be more and more compatible, not only compatible with environment, but positive actors in the field of environment. And that is one, one element. Um, the feeling is that this dialogue with private funds must go on, and insurances, sorry, insurances company, must go on because there is still a kind of gray zone. What is the problem with, uh, with the reputation? Is it the, the, the defense domain is a regulated domain because it's not a domain like others exactly. It's a very specific domain, which means that it's, in a way, it is more secure than, well, safer than other domains because it's very strictly regulated. Uh, there are things you cannot do in the defense sector that you could do perhaps in the health sector. Uh, I take one of your ideas. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it's very regulated, but at the same time, some investors, and pr particularly equity funds, could be afraid that when they want to valorize, valorize, valorize? 
to have added value from an operation, uh, then they could be obstacles put by the states. And now there was a very clear uh, explanation by uh, governmental uh, participants is that it's very oka par ka, case by case, and then there is no systematic policy to hamper uh, valorization, but uh, just checking that it's a solid partner and a solid partner for the future under sound uh, conditions. I think I will probably uh, stop here. Then, with to sum up, it's more about lending policies most of the time than really regulation or statutes or, or of some uh, structures. And secondly, I think one very important uh, item to make sure that everybody considers that defense uh, activities are sound. It's not only the proof that we have unhappily every day that it is absolutely central in peace and safety, but it's also that um, the more we will have an internal European market, uh, the, the easier it will be to consider that we are s producing and selling armaments in, um, under partners about which there is absolutely no doubt. It doesn't mean that uh, we must, the, the European industry uh, must not export. I, it's, uh, it's an important part of the business model. It's also an important part of the partnership for peace that we can have in the world. Uh, but if we have a kind of core uh, business, uh, with an internal market, I think it's part of the sound character of the defense activities. I'll stop here. Thank you, Professor Arnaud. Uh, Patrick Belloir, all my ap apologizes because Madame the Minister had to leave. So I just want to give her five minutes just to how to foster innovation because your ministry is integrated in the economy ministry. So. Could you explain to us, to, to the public, um, what's happening with public finance from your point of view? What are your plans? Or just tell us, what about your everyday life in your ministry for fostering innovation? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting because what we see in other countries uh, that basically, for example, in France, for the Defense Innovation is responsible Ministry of uh, uh, Army, it's, it's called, yes, uh, I think. You have an agency within the... <laughs> yes, and for example, in Lithuania, uh, Ministry of Defense, our MOD is responsible for uh, procurement policy, for, of course, military uh, aspects, and our ministry is responsible for the defense industry and innovation promotion. So that's the difference, and or probably that, that's why I am here. Uh, you know, uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, we are talking about defense innovation more and more uh, because what we see in uh, what we saw in Ukraine that it's actually a technological war uh, uh, to the some point. Uh, and uh, um, we uh, understand and understood that we have to be smarter faster in the battlefield so that's why we have to change our mindset we have to change the mindset of the military uh, to use technologies and it's a paradox because if we will see historically uh, at the beginning of the 19th century at the, uh, during the first world war the second world war all the innovations came from the military sector and the major shift uh, happened uh, after the Cold War, uh, when the, all the investments uh, to, uh, uh, to the defense sector from the government uh, were lower and lower and lower, and uh, uh, the shift uh, happened, uh, and major technolo technologies are produced in, in the private, uh, in, in private sector. Uh, in our corporates in our basic major technology uh, corporations. Uh, so uh, what we see in Lithuania and try to promote is uh, to create more trust among the military and private sector, private companies, uh, because uh, to bring those innovations from the private sector to military people is critical nowadays. Uh, 
Uh, also for us it is extremely important to uh, create a strong partnership uh, among defense, about, among military, uh, our uh, both ministries and of course uh, business and academia. Uh, we are working on the creation of Miltech Sandbox. It's like a, uh, um, an, it's not an agency, it will be a part of uh, our innovation agency and it will that be it, it will be dedicated to the uh, uh, common projects for the um, uh, timely indications of the demands from the military side. Uh, also, we are thinking to uh, have some financial support mechanism for the um, uh, new ideas, promotions, and uh, and uh, etc. So we are taking seriously uh, this because what we had uh, before we had only uh, technological innovation program in MOD uh, but it was uh, quite limited uh, with quite limited resources that's why our ministry decided that we have to combine our resources and to use both of our strengths because only through the collaboration you can um, you can achieve the best results so that's our point of view, how, uh, how to promote that. And what I know that, for example, USA, uh, Israel, uh, United Kingdom, France at, the, uh, at the, your Defense Innovation Agency uh, are working in the way uh, I described. So in my opinion, Lithuania, which is geopolitically a vulnerable country, it also has to have such a uh, model of collaboration among business and, um, and military. Um, do I need to add something? I, I've, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> Oh, um, I mean, being the, a part of the Ministry of Economy, yeah. um, you are probably having something to deal with uh, aid of state or not, or not yet. What about the, the debate? Because public financing is missing a little in, the deba in this debate. Well, uh, at the moment in Lithuania, probably uh, all the financing support and finances are coming from the state budget. Mm. Uh, military, uh, M our MOD uh, is financing uh, all uh, acquisitions, of course, it's natural. Uh, also, they uh, use state budget to promote some technological innovations. Uh, our ministry uh, tries to combine uh, funding. Uh, we Last year, we launched the uh, Millinvest Fund. Uh, it's actually based on venture capital uh, funding and, of course, uh, with the combination Public of uh, state uh, uh, of state uh, budget, so that's quite a new model uh, for uh, financing defense in Lithuania, uh, and I'm happy that we uh, managed to do that. And talking about the uh, innovation, of course, our our companies uh, intensively use uh, European uh, funds, but of course, it's only only for dual use, and uh, it's uh, it's a pity actually. Uh, because we have some companies which uh, would love to use that fund, but they are not dual use. They are all already categorized as the weapons. Uh, so that maybe also could be a change in that legal uh, legislation on uh, on EU uh, EU level. So you know, uh, basically, our ministry provides that financial combination, and from the MOD side, it's uh, more uh, state budget financing. But uh, but in my opinion, uh, it should be in that way because yeah. you can't make MOD uh, to think and behave like a Ministry of Economy or Innovation. It's it's natural. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, for your explanation. And uh, goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Patrick Belois, for your patience. Uh, former president of OCA, representing, chairing Eurodefense France. Uh, of course, you will give a French point of view, but I know you're totally able to talk about a more European point of view, even if you're French and representing more or less French interests in that field. 
I'm not representing French interests today. I mean, I, I'm really uh, uh, promoting European cooperation. And Thank not, you very not, much. Not supporting French interests. Um, uh, by the way, I'm no longer the, the, the chair of Euro Defense France. Uh, I was. Uh, I've been the, the chair of Euro Defense France for f five years, but uh, I'm no longer the, the chairman. Uh, th thank you. Um, so um, I will say a few words on uh, um, on European cooperation. Uh, no, no, not uh, and if, and I will mention what uh, a, a few things of what have been discussed during the the. Uh, the the uh, roundtable uh, this afternoon, but not everything because it was a call, uh, a closed session. But uh, but uh, at least a few a few, a few main points. Um, growing tensions in the world, electoral uncertainties, and above all, the war launched by Russia against Ukraine since February two thousand and twenty-two, and Russian threats towards the West underline the need to urgently improve in quality and volume. European operational and industrial defense capabilities. I think every, everybody agrees agree with this. Europeans see clearly that the situation has deteriorated for several years. However, and uh, we have an example uh, here in the panel, they do not seem ready to build a real European defense, which would constitute a solid and credible European pillar of the Atlantic Alliance, and the vast majority prefer to continue to trust in the guarantee of protection from the United States, despite new uncertainties weighing on this guarantee and the conditions that our great ally continues to impose on its partners, particularly in terms of arms purchases, the F-35 contract. However, we must prepare ourselves as Europeans for the worst scenarios. We never know. We never know. Um, in fact, when we compare the respective GDP and defense budget of the Russian Federation and all EU member states, including during the entire period when they reduced their defense budget below, well below 2% of GDP, one may be surprised at the fear inspired by Russia. Financially speaking, Europeans have always had the means to put up a credible defense against, against Russia. However, I mean, we all recognize that, we should, that um, the, uh, the budgets have been, uh, uh, sh should be increased. And in fact, both within the uh, uh, framework of NATO and the EU, Europeans have been committed for several years to restoring defense budgets to the ratio of 2% of GDP. In their joint communication of March 5, 2024, ADIS, the European Commission and the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy underline that with this level of 2% between 2006 and 2020, including 20% devoted to investments, the Europeans would have had an additional 1,100 billion euros available for the defense, including 2020. 2,070 billion euros for investments. Such so huge amounts, a huge amount. We would have done a lot of things with this, with this money. But increasing budgets is not enough, as, as, uh, we, uh, as we can see, and as have been uh, you know, agreed by, uh, by the Commission and other people. If European states continue, as they have done for more than 70 years, to cooperate with each other as little as possible, less than 20% of their defense investments, and to purchase their weapons equipment largely outside Europe. In fact, uh, around 60% of over the last decades, but even almost 80% in 2022 for urgent needs, of mainly in the United States, they will never be able to build an effective European defense based on a solid and competitive European defense industrial and technological base, and acquires a desired strategic autonomy. Member states must therefore absolutely strengthen their cooperation and armaments. This need for more for and better cooperation between Europeans is not new. Numerous initiatives in this direction have been taken over the past 30 years with mixed success. Tools have been put in place since the end of the, of the 90s. They exist and they work. Uh, I, will, uh, I will mention some of them. 
uh, structures they were first created, the OCAR in 1998. Uh, OCAR means Organisation Conjointe de Coopération en Matière d'Armement. It, it is a multilateral organization created outside the framework of the EU. Then uh, the European Defence Agency, EDA, was created in 2004 within uh, EU. Um, then various programs were launched from the end of 2017. The Permanent Structured Corporation, uh, the, the uh, card system, the card system, um, Coordinated Annual Review on Defence. Thank you. Um, I mean, this is the problem with uh, with uh, uh, with the EU. There are a lot of acronyms, and, and we uh, <laughs> we didn't <laughs> we have difficulties to know the meaning sometimes. The card system piloted by the EDA, which is intended to consolidate the capabilities process between the EU member states, and more recently the European Defence Fund, led by the Commission, financed by the EU budget to finance cooperative research and development activities within the EU. And uh, this, uh, I mean, there are real projects, you know, funded by, the, by uh, this uh, program. Finally, the strategic compass, the first European white paper exercise was adopted on March, 20, March 25, 2022 by the European Council. All these tools have enabled significant progress, but we must recognize that work still needs to be done to ensure that the tools in place are better used particularly in terms of convergence of military needs upstream of programs. And this was especially mentioned during our meeting. So the, the need for um, agreement, convergence of military needs, because I mean, the, the problem is not, you know, uh, for, indus for industry to um, um, uh, um, uh, cr create equipment which the, the industry wants to create. The problem is, I mean, for industry to provide the, the, the weapons that the armies of the member states really need to counter the, the threats. This is the problem. Uh, and this is a, one of the main problem is, you know, for uh, this convergence, you know, between the needs of, I don't know, the member, sta uh, member states, which, and this convergence needs real coordination, I mean, uh, discussions within, between the, uh, armies of EU member states. Um, all the, um, and, the, and the convergence of needs, uh, as which is essential, as I said, to effective cooperation, must at the same time lead to industrial consolidation at European level and the elimination of unnecessary duplication. There are these uh, uh, consolidation and, and elimination of duplication are guarantees for of efficiency which may require painful compromises and a certain political courage. Uh, there, is an, uh, there is another point which has been mentioned also during our meeting, is the governance, governance issue. I mean, for, of course, uh, the, uh, um, all the activities which will be um, uh, uh, covered by cooperation. And then, uh, and, and, um, and another one, uh, uh, the third point is agreement on export rules. I mean, it is important also when we, uh, we, uh, when nations um, commit, you know, where, um, themselves to cooperation, that you know they they agree on export rules. Otherwise, of course, uh, this may uh, create problems in the future. So, if the EU truly wants to build an EDTIB, I mean, European Defense Technological and Industrial Base, worthy of the name and acquire certain strategic autonomy in defense matters, it will not be able to avoid this, this, this um, progress, consolidations, um, uh, elimination of duplication, agreements uh, on um, convergence of needs, uh, agreements on export rules, etc. On March 4, uh, 5, 2024, the European Commission and the High Representative of the Union um, have uh, released a joint communication and uh, a draft regulation intended to provide nuances to these questions. Uh, of course, the proposals in this document, some of which are not entirely new, but are 
expressed here, perhaps with greater force and clarity, uh, will uh, undoubtedly be the subject of careful consideration and debate between the parties concerned, Council, European Parliament, and Commission. I personally uh, hope that uh, the discussions will be fully successful. Uh, I, th I think this is an important step. I mean, we, we cannot uh, uh, um, uh, miss this opportunity. I think this, uh, I mean, uh, increase of cooperation is so, is so mandatory for the future. I think this proposal of the Commission for me is very important. Of course, there are points which must be discussed. I mean, of course, we cannot agree on everything. I mean, members, member states will certainly, you know, um, uh, have uh, points to, uh, to uh, discuss, the Parliament as well. But I, 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 I think, you know, um, Claude France, to, uh, that she mentioned Galileo, which is a good example. I think, where, for example, my um, uh, expectation is that your um, proposal will allow, in the future, will allow the European Union to um, fund in the future military programs similar to Galileo. I think, uh, I'm sure that there, will be, there are needs for the entire EU um, to um, develop uh, systems which will be useful for, the, and, and for all EU member states, especially in the space domain and uh, um, for defense. And there is no reason for me uh, that, the, uh, that the EU could not fund this kind, this kind of uh, project. So, I mean, simi similar to uh, what uh, was done for uh, civil programs such as Galileo. So I, I wish you all the best for the future. <laughs> Thank you very much. So on for again. <laughs> if your everyday life is to shape innovative legislation in order to foster our uh, industry in the field of defense, how can you deal in your everyday working life with such a declaration like this from Thierry Breton saying that 100 billion euros are necessary to go uh, to, to obtain the objectives they want to obtain? Uh, I mean, considering your mandate at the beginning, how do you deal, how can you deal with such a declaration? deal very well with such a declaration. I think the intention of Commissioner Breton was not to say that we need 100 billion for EU programs. I think he wanted to point out to a level of ambition of what we should do together collectively in Europe. And, it, it, and, and I think it was really trying to put a, an amount on the table to, to create also the discussion because we see that uh, the, 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 the European Union has, uh, as, and it was uh, mentioned by uh, Claude France Arnoux, really made efforts to now uh, uh, support defense industry. We have the European Defense Fund with 8 billion. We have, uh, we have ASAP with 500 million. We have EDIAPA with 300 million, but this is not enough. And I think because the situation has changed, the needs are different. And I think member states are making the effort to increase their defense budget. The EU should also do it because we need cooperation and we have to avoid national silos in the way we invest because we need to be more efficient at, at the scale of the world and at the scale of the threats we need to cooperate. So I think the idea of uh, Commissioner Breton was really to, to put an amount uh, in terms of collective ambition for the next MFF was not something that would constrain my daily work, <laughs> if you want. I think it's just, uh, on, on the contrary, I think it helps to put a level of ambition. At the level of the Commission, we are here to try to uh, develop and, and to do some uh, develop policy initiatives that would support cooperation that would facilitate uh, the life of member states and that would uh, also benefit the European defense industry. And of course, what we have to do is to work with a system where originally defense industry or defense is, but defense industry was not the main sector of interest for the European Commission. It, it's, it's quite recent, but we have to see how we can use our tools and we have powerf powerful tools, the EU budget, 
the EU regulatory power to come in support of more defense industrial cooperation. And this is what we are trying to do. We have started with uh, R&D, and it, it's a pity that uh, Madame Laminis left because mm. actually we are doing a lot for defense innovation. There is two billion out of the eight billion of the EDF that is de that is de are dedicated to defense innovation with quite uh, smart, innovative ways also of dealing with, with uh, startups and scale-ups. Uh, uh, sorry, so with loans, with... Yes, with, with loans, with grants. Heads, I mean, there grants, are different uh, ways. Our, our programs are mostly grants-based, but we have, we have also worked with the European Investment Fund to, to create a defense equity facility for innovative startups. So mm. we are really trying to develop uh, new tools using the, the powerful tools I think that the uh, Commission has at its disposal that was given to, uh, to the Commission by the EU treaties. And again, always in complementing, supporting the role of member states. Of course, we have a specific objective that we think that cooperation is really necessary, so we will use our tools to incentivize. But again, we are not there to replace member states, we are not there to force member states, but we are trying to propose measures that will have a, a, an added value. And as, as uh, Monsieur Bilois also mentioned, we have now this uh, European Defense Industry Strategy, which also talks a lot about partners, I mean Ukraine, but also you know uh, that we need to have a, an enhanced structured uh, dialogue with NATO. I mean NATO is, you, we have 22nd member states of, of uh, the EU that are in NATO. I mean, so we, we, but we also think that to be uh, credible in NATO, we have, we need to have a strong defense industrial basis. And again, I think uh, the idea of our program is to integrate everyone. So if you look at uh, the award criteria, we, we, we give more funding if you have an opening of cross-border supply chain. So that all our um, programs are geared towards more cooperation and more in inclusion. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really important that uh, uh, we have made these proposals. We have now a legislative proposal that will be discussed with member states and the parliament. Of course, there will be changes because, you know, that's the way it works in the EU. The Commission does not decide. The Commission proposes and then it's decided by the co-legislators and collectively, hopefully, we'll come to an agreement on the measures we, we put on the table. Proposing a fr framework of, of, of trust, we could say, to encourage private investors in saying, with other words, thank you very much. Uh, creating more trust uh, in Poland with the other European members, because uh, it's a lot about uh, buying uh, American aircrafts. I mean, in France, we are only talking about it. Uh, but I also know Poland uh, is entered in negotiation with Sweden. I mean, they're, they're step by step entering uh, a European uh, market of defense. Maybe you have a, a comment of these very, very last developments, because it was a week ago, right? Yes, yeah, so we just bought two surveillance aircrafts from, from the SAP uh, group, and we also are conducting together some, uh, you know, shipyard industry uh, the projects, um, uh, and so, so some naval capabilities. So, but, but you know, uh, let me come back to, to my first point, that actually, you know, all the military cooperation and defense, uh, defense industry cooperation need to be based on the common threat perception. And actually, I believe, you know, that the, the, the cooperation between points and Sweden is easier because you know we clearly defined what 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 is our mind mind threat and, and, and challenge and you know I believe that like Swedish Minister of Defense as a first uh, you know announced that that you know as a um, EU NATO we need to be prepared you know for the full-fledged war with Russia probably in several years so so Swed Swedish uh, friends are, are very clear with their you know defense perception uh, threat perception defense priorities and so on and so for. So, uh, so I believe right now, if, if there will be any any kind of closer cooperation, including you know Central Eastern Europe, Baltic Sea region, and so on and so forth, it can be closer cooperation between Poland, Baltic states, Sweden, and possibly UK. So, so actually, actually there are you know UK is of course out, out of the uh, European Union right now, but they are still close partner in the industrial terms with with many many European European countries. But I see also that huge potential 
bilateral, in bilateral relations between Poland and France. So, so most of you know that that uh, you know we have very strong uh, you know hist record of, of of bilateral cooperation for po from uh, for Poland. You know, uh, France uh, was the most important ally uh, since 16th century, I believe. You know, during the the, 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 the pre-war, pre-second war peri period. Uh, you know, uh, uh, France was major uh, major ally for Poland and, and countries of, of the region. Uh, even after the war, the goal was the first uh, Western leader who visited Poland. Uh, you know, even until you know Soviet domination uh, domination that time. So we have really 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 strong um, uh, record of of, of uh, bilateral cooperation based also on on the interest. Uh, you know, so so the Polish American and Polish British cooperation it's it's really new phenomenon. It's it's like it started after after the Cold War, but but uh, you know uh, as as we uh, as you know both countries right now are seeking more partnerships in Europe based on the change of, of geopolitical situation. I think that that we can we can base and and build you know on on this on this on this record. So um, I know that that also in French France there is a change of perception when it comes to Russia right now. Uh, it's uh, Macron I believe who is one of the most hawkish uh, European leader when it comes to when it comes to um, uh, yeah, poli our poli common policy towards towards Russia, so uh, basically I see that that there is a, a potential for that, and and we can we can we can definitely build on that. But uh, you know, uh, discussing also uh, the EU uh, in this whole structure, uh, yeah, I think it was it was Bonaparte who said that you need to f three things to win the war: it's money, money, money. Uh, so so actually actually I believe it's it's also the case when it comes to European Union uh, industrial industrial policy. So it's it's very good that we we create many new tools, and even if we establish new commissionary uh, for commissioner for 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 defense, it's, it's very important thing. But you need to give him some tools, and actually actually you know it's my my advice. It's also maybe if we uh, will be you know taking some decision about personal things when it comes to commissioner of, of defense it it will be good to consider somebody from the central eastern europe actually you know that uh, once again in discussion about nato secretary general you know it was kaya kalas who was one of, one of the front, uh, front runner but but uh, you know uh, the, probably we decided uh, it's not official yet but but that it mark Rutte uh, uh, from netherlands will be new secretary general so so central eastern europe once again feel that that it's not Probably treated equally, you know, in, in in European European defense. Even if we we are really serious about our defense, you know, when it comes to defense spending policy and so on and so forth. So maybe it's in this case it's, it's worth to consider, you know, engaging uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, you know, to the, the whole discussion about European security, also when it comes to the the, the, the personal issue. And I believe, you know, we need to give a new commissioner significant uh, measures, you know, to to implement this. Policy. Policy. So I believe that that you know I, I'm of course not representing the government of Poland, so I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of myself. But but nevertheless, I believe there there will be some sympathy from the Polish side, you know, for the recent French an initiative that 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 we maybe should uh, you know issue some bonds uh, to to. Um, Establish kind of the fund uh, which can uh, which could cover uh, uh, investment in in defense industry because uh, you are absolutely right that that we need that uh, you know business uh, armament industry in Europe it's private it's different than in Russia so so you cannot just uh, say you know the saw or BAE that that you need to build new lines of 155 uh, uh, munition uh, or something and uh, you know uh, business uh, uh, consider it that. That you know, it's it's significant investment, and pay you back like in in 15 years or something. So if our governments like change the policy after I don't know five years, so they 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 will just lose the money. So so we need to show a business that we have a money. We are serious about investment in the in the in, in our defense industry, and they, they can easily start to build new new capacity, new production lines, and so on and so forth. But once again, you need to money for that. Thank you. Are you saying the new government, and I'm kidding a little, the new government is fostering relations with France, because it's very important here to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, are you saying the new Polish government is more serious in the field of 
industry, uh, defense, uh, relations in Europe. Uh, maybe, can you give some more elements about this? Because I think in Paris today, it's very important to, to talk about that. Yeah, but, but you all, you know, like watch TV and you, you realize that, that one of the first visits of our new prime minister, it was Paris, yes. And right now we reinvigorated Weimar Martiangu, uh, the, the cooperation in, in France and, and, and Germany. Our foreign minister was, was in, in Paris. Actually, our even like our foreign minister also support as a first, you know, the, the, the Macron initiative. That, that we should, you know, increase the level of strategic ambiguity when, when it comes to Russia and not exclude possibility of, of sending, let's say, troops to, 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 to Ukraine in any, any, any conditions. So, so actually, actually, I see that, that there is like much more openness from, from the from side of, of our governments toward, towards France and towards our, our Western partners. So as, as I said, I, I believe that, that you know, uh, we, uh, of course, we need to be ready. We, 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 our, our first priority is to maintain strong, uh, you know, uh, uh, transatlantic relations uh, as long as is possible. And, and uh, it's, it's, of course, the first thing. But, but, you know, even excluding the Trump factor, you know, there can be, I can imagine any kind of contingency that, that because of, uh, I don't know, the tension in the Taiwan Strait or something, U.S. will not be able to, to provide Europe with certain, certain capabilities. So we definitely we need to have uh, you know uh, to have more cooperation here in Europe. So one one uh, you know axis I see as I mentioned you know Poland, not only Sweden but but uh, but also Scandinavian country as in in general Baltic states United Kingdom. But I see also the huge potential in Polish French and possibly also British British relation in this kind of the triangle. triangle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, more trust in the legal framework will add more trust with, with, between the governments from the Polish, with Lithuania, with, with, uh, with Gnosis too. More trust in technology, Claude France Arnoux. You talked about Galileo. I mean, everybody, everybody knows this technology. Uh, it's about 10 years now we are, we are using it. So uh, it's a uh, healthy competition with American technology. Uh, which technology do you think uh, will be the next one, uh, the very trustful technology for our European citizens and uh, for uh, all of us? Oh. I will not answer to this question to say what is the technology. One. And I think what we have now to do is to be able to face a lot of threats, the present war and the future, and we don't know how future it will be, threats everywhere in the world. Uh, that is the first uh, issue. Uh, and for that, we need, uh, it's not 10 years, it's 20, 30 years to develop then I think what we have to be able to deliver now is support to our defense or dual, of course, many technologies are dual, we have already mentioned it, technologies that will give us a superiority and the <coughs> freedom of action, call it as you want, sovereignty, uh, uh, autonomy, strategy, uh, but Verhandlungsfähigkeit or Handlungsfähigkeit, but to have this freedom of action now and tomorrow, then that is, I think, the 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 main issue to de def to define the technologies we need, and most of them again will will be dual, but dual means having technologies for defense that are coming from the civilian sector and having technology in the civilian fields. And the, our American friends are very good at that, coming from the, the defense sector in all fields. Uh, then I'm sorry, I won't answer to the question. I think the problem we have is to be able to provide now for the technologies we will need, not only now vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, Ukraine facing Russia, but tomorrow vis-a-vis -vis threats that can come from far away over the seas, 
uh, from the south, from the sky, from, from the space, from, from everywhere. And then we have to face that. And second, something we, have, we didn't mention is mass production. And it's why we, we need all the financial support, human support. We didn't mention talent. You did it, skills, and uh, to make sure that we can both have not again one technology, but uh, the different technologies that will be relevant. And for the time being, we, we don't know. Who would have said 10 years ago that artificial intelligence would be the uh, technology? Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, 10 years is nothing. Then again, all technologies, but also to be able to have a massive production, then to have this versatility of, or agility, and uh, again, resource uh, to do that. And as you mentioned uh, very, uh, and also Patrick, uh, cooperation to, to do that. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. <laughs> yes, but I, but I want to um, uh, add something. I think I, I want to, make, uh, to uh, uh, make everybody understand that the uh, European industry is able to provide the same level of technology as the US I mean, uh, and, and the example of Galileo is typical, but uh, um, we, we, are, we have, we to have built... It, say no, no, it, say yes, it. Yes, but, but let, me, let me finish. We have built a system which has uh, with, uh, better performances than the GPS systems. The GPS. However, when you, uh, we are continuing to mention GPS, you know, and in your car, you know, or everybody, every, 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 you know, all of you, you have a GPS in your car. This is stupid. You receive at the same time the GPS and the Galileo signal, and you don't know that. Huh? And because of the, yeah, I think there is a lack of communication from the, the, uh, the EU. You receive, you know, the, the signals from both systems, and you don't know that, and you continue to mention the GPS or instead of Galileo. You should mention you have Galileo in your car. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're right. We are the Paris Defense and Strategy Forum. We have to firmly say it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, another question for you, for all of you, because uh, people there in the audience, I know you will have some things to declare about the, this defense commissioner we are talking about, more or less. From your point of view, Thomas, it's, it's directly linked with the investment in the defense industry. It could create, maybe, trust in investment in industry. That's right, but I understood it quite well. Okay, maybe you in the audience, you, you want to share your uh, feelings about this new commissioner first, and if you have other questions, please let me know and I will give you the mic. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask the commission, but perhaps other panelists can 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 uh, chip in with their views too. If the European defense industry strategy is successful within a scope that would cons would be considered, a, you know, a better case scenario, what effect would that have on the currently ongoing but sort of delayed common defense projects like the next generation tank, next generation aircraft, or or uh, all the naval instruments and so on. And uh, if this is not a question that can be uh, answered, what kind of projects other than these sort of packages would be the ones that would showcase the success of this strategy as, as sort of the first pioneer projects or something like that? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think it's difficult to uh, make a direct link on, on the impact of EDIS on, on the project you mentioned, but what I would like to underline is that we know that cooperation is complex. 
we see that. I mean, there are many reasons why cooperation in the armament field is something that is not easy. Uh, and that's why I think one of the objective uh, of, of EDIS, but also in, in of the previous instrument that we developed at EU level, is to facilitate cooperation. And I think it's a kind of, I would say, virtuous circle. Uh, for example, when we have started with EDF, I mean, um, we, in EDF, we bring together industrial partners, but you always have a bit member states behind that promote certain projects. The commission does, doesn't choose the priority. She does that together with the member state. I think it's very important to recall. Uh, but the fact that we have incentive to uh, promote cooperation has as an impact that industrial partners try, uh, start to cooperate. And member states that are sponsoring, I would say, certain project also need to cooperate. So in a way, it's a kind of, you know, incentives that by promoting cooperation helps to put some oil in the motor, I would say. So I think it's, it, it, in, in essence, it's beneficial to cooperate, cooperation at large because member states and industry start to work with new partners. And this is something that was very interesting on the first you know, feedback that we heard, for example, from industry and big primes in Europe, is that oh, because I, I was, we were a bit forced to, to look for partners in, in other member states, actually I discovered a very interesting uh, manufacturer in another member state that I didn't know of, but that would actually add with its innovation potential or added value, reinforce my projects. And I think by promoting cooperation, uh, I, I think at the end it, it helps also the cooperation on bigger projects. And with the European Defense, um, Defense Industrial Strategy, we also mentioned that we should focus, and I, I, I take the opportunity to make the link to what uh, uh, Patrick Belloir was saying on, on you know, what would be the next Galileo or the defense type of project. We, we talk about defense, European defense project of common interest. The idea is really to try to identify together with member states, because member states are the users, it's not the commission, member states armed forces are the users, what are the projects that we should develop, type of infrastructure, defense infrastructure, uh, in particular, when we talk about contested areas, space, cyber, that we should develop collectively in Europe to, um, with the, the help of the EU budget. And for that, so we have uh, in, in our proposal um, and in the EDIP uh, legislative proposal uh, make some, some reference to this project. And we are also pro uh, proposing to create a, a legal framework that will facilitate cooperation. So I would say that uh, we have uh, really the way we work is to put to have a kind of toolbox to promote cooperation, being with legal framework, with budget, and then we will we 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 try to incentivize member states to use this project for the priorities that they find important. And for the definition of priorities, we don't um, work in a vacuum. We of course rely on the prioritization mechanism that exists in the EU and in particular the tools developed within the European Defence Agency. But then we need to further filter them to make sure you know that there is a link between the priorities and what we can do with our industrial programs. So I think it's more kind of providing a toolbox uh, but the idea is indeed to have more and more big European programs that include as many member states as possible. I think this is very important for us to have an inclusive uh, industrial cooperation in Europe, because I think otherwise we will not get the support of all member states to, to, to support European cooperation if, if we don't integrate all the member states in one way or the other uh, to the benefit of uh, the competitiveness of, and the innovation capacity of the defense industry. May I add um, one or two examples? Because you, you gave the, the approach, the, the way forward, uh, but just a guess on uh, two, two examples. We already mentioned space, Galileo, uh, Iris Square is launched. Uh, couldn't we look at space situational awareness or space domain awareness and make sure that we have a free access to space and, and, and having a response to the threats and to the dependency uh, that very large dependencies that we have, uh, again, on the United States as regard uh, the security in, in space, in low orbit. First example, it's a, just an example, but we, you ask for that. I will take another example, and perhaps it could also fit uh, with the criteria you mentioned, that is to be inclusive for all member states, including those member states who buy 
European and those member states who buy non-European. Uh, it's a question of collaborative combat. The Academy for Air and Space has uh, issued an advice on that. Uh, if we, some of our member states buy F-35, others will fly uh, Rafale and Eurofighter and the successor, the uh, FCAS, the FCAS. Um, we, it's absolutely vital that they would be able to, inter, to, to, to combat together. Then a, a project like collaborative combat is uh, of common interest, industrial interest, and particularly operational interest. Just an example, it's not necessarily what the member states will choose and decide, but it's just to give examples of rather new capabilities that we, but we know we need them, and we know it's absolutely key to be interoperable interoperable between Europeans. Creating trust again between the, troops, the troops. Capability to fight together. Capability to fight together, but trust with the citizens, because citizens have also to understand what's going on. I'm trying to make the link with our audience. Uh, please. Yes, a toolbox is very important, but uh, what about uh, a new tool? Uh, I think to uh, uh, I think about uh, uh, a common European loan of 100 billion euros for the European defense aid to Ukraine. Uh, is the idea progressing uh, or, or not? Uh, what, what, what is this financial tool? It's an it's a uh, important tool for the toolbox. Indeed, as, as we say, we need funds, but I mean, you know, you don't find money like this. So we have a budget in the EU and we, we, are, uh, we have already mobilized it in favor of defense. And we hope, as we, as we say in the European Defense Industry Strategy, that in the next MFF, even more financial support from the EU budget will be devoted to defense because the situation is different. But of course, the, the, the EU budget, you know, is not defined by the Commission, its contribution in part by member states, we also have direct resources. I think it's a collective decision, political decision, to decide how, how much uh, money you put into the EU budget and how much part of the EU budget you put into defense. It's a decision by the member states and, and uh, to a certain extent also by the parliament. But I think so that's important. On, the, on the, what you were mentioning, and we have heard also the, the issue of defense funds, I think many ideas are on the table and I think we need to be creative. I think we need to be smart and look for innovative solution to, to try to maximize the possible investment to defense. EU budget is one avenue, but it's maybe not the only avenue. You could also create, you know, try to, 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 to create speci specific vehicles to, to maybe go on the market and, and, and create defense fund. I mean, there are all these ideas on the table. For the moment, the commission was not tasked to, to work on the defense funds, but this is something that uh, I think is, has already reached the political level. And I think we, if we had to do it, we know how to create s s this kind of mechanism. But of course, I mean, it has to be also very well uh, thought because you need also to make sure that you will be able to, to raise this money on, on the capital market. So I think for, for us, from the Commission side, uh, we are trying to put, as you said, different tools. The, 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 the resources are crucial. I think everybody agrees and it was underlined. And I think we need to look at uh, different solutions uh, on how to make sure that we have the necessary financial support to really be serious about investing in our defense. Thank you very much. Very last question, please. Very quickly, I'm a professor of finance at Sorbonne University, and what you describe for difficulties for SMEs to have equity, to be funded in a certain range of size of, of companies is what I see in other sectors. So it's not a problem specifically for defense, it's a problem of culture, of funding uh, companies and uh, private initiative in Europe. So, okay, the tools, the legal framework, saying that taxonomy finally is not a problem with defense. Uh, how is it possible to, to change the, the state of mind of investors or, or people who ask funding or build the, the file and give documents? Because in fact, on other technologies like artificial intelligence, if you look the money put on the table by the US and by the Chinese actually compare, if you see OpenAI with the most important French companies in AE. So, so in fact, the, the success for, for the funding of the defense area will be to also, but for all the economy in Europe, to, to me perhaps more collective, but 
to change the state of mind, of so restricting policies from investors and from banks also. As a former member of the board of a bank, I can say that <laughs> it's very difficult to fund some risky activities, even if it is no defense. So, so how can we play on the state of mind? Just not on all the rest, but at the end, we need people with ambition to do that. No, the European Commission I agree so much <laughs> with you that I have nothing more to add. I think there are many elements, and it's a culture vis-a-vis -vis risk. Uh, and, and something I discovered when I, I tried to support a, a startup is that we, we have a culture which is if we support a, a venture, it has to be successful, and we have to take care during its full life. Um, and I think we, if we want to, 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 to be able to, to have the same resource, not necessarily the same, but the same uh, echelle uh, at the Amer scale of, of, of resource that the Americans have, it's really, I think, at the heart of uh, the, the culture of risk. You invest, it functions or it fails, but it will succeed next time. Maybe if I may, to complement, actually there is a, an additional hurdle with uh, SMEs active in the defense field. I mean, we have conducted a study that we published two months ago. Um, I mean, we, we ask a consultant to conduct the study, but it's a, a commission study that shows that for defense SMEs and small uh, mid-caps, there is an additional hurdle linked to the sector and to the reputational issue as well. So I think we know that access to finance for SMEs is a, is a problem for all SMEs throughout the European economy, and I think there are a lot of initiatives in that context, but it's even more difficult for defense. Uh, how to solve that? I, think we, I, I don't think there is a silver bullet, but I think what we say in EDIS is that first we need to reaffirm and, and to sensibilize about the importance of the defense industry and how the defense industry is a, a crucial part of our defense, because I think there is also a, 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 a kind of... A, appreciation of the importance of the sector. And then what we have started to do, because then we have to really look at the, at the, 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 the concrete examples, and I think in the, in the close workshop that we had, it was also very interesting to listen to the financial sector according to them, you know, what is the problem, or, or, or also listen to industry, so to really identify what are the concrete examples. So apparently it's more about equity, that about loans, and also uh, what we have discovered, and I think it's different for, for, for defense and for the, uh, any other sector, is that you have still in Europe, in many financial uh, institutions, in many banks, exclusion policies, exclusion lending policies that specifically excludes uh, defense products, weapons, ammunition. So I think it's, it's not something that you can totally compare with another sector. And there are reasons for that. There can be, you know, of course, reputational risk. There's the issue that uh, for a lot of uh, investors also, the, the, the defense sector is something that they don't know, that is a kind of black box, so they don't want to, uh, to invest. Uh, and they don't know that the defense is a highly regulated sector. Uh, there is the question of exports. I think we have to be very frank. Some do not want to take the risk of having one of the company they, they invest in uh, selling uh, uh, weapons outside, killing uh, civilian children. I mean, there are many questions around why we would not, uh, I mean, I exaggerate a bit, but that's what you hear when you talk with pension funds. With, uh, with banks that, you know, there is this reputational issue, even if it's a small part of their portfolio, and they prefer to stay outside of defense. So I think it's important to first recall what is the contribution that defense industry can make to our overall um, security, then to engage really and look at the specific problems. We have seen, we have heard also this morning that there are some best practices that are developed in certain countries to be able really to identify what are the, the, the problems. And at the level of the EU, what we want to do is to have a European approach. So we want to have a kind of more structured engagement with the financial sector, with the insurance sector. It's not about only about access to finance, it's also uh, how to, you, are, you are going to be insured. Uh, with also with uh, rating agencies. I mean, uh, there are a lot of different peoples uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in this ecosystem and to see how we can actually, what, what do they need to be able to invest? Because we see there is a, little, a bit of change. We see that there is a, this trend is much more pronounced in other countries outside the EU, like in the UK, they have no problem anymore, I mean, I'm exaggerate, to invest in defense because they see opportunities. I mean, the market is uh, 
also increasing. So, so we have to better understand what are the, the, the breaks into investing into defense and how we can help. What we identify in the European Defense uh, Investment Strategy is also that uh, we, we are also asking the European Investment Bank to give a signal because a lot of uh, investors says or in lot of banks say, but you are asking us to be more active in, in defense, but your own bank, which is the Bank of the European Union, has a quite restrictive exclusion policy. So we are also working very closely with the IB, but at the end, the, the, the shareholders of the IB are the member states. So at the end, it's also up to member states to send the signal. So I think, you know, there are many um, actors that we need to mobilize if we want to see a change in that, uh, in that respect. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming from Brussels, from Paris, from Basel, from Vilnius. Thank you for having highlighted the complexity of the galaxy of what we are talking about. It's not only a topic from European Commission, <laughs> you know. Uh, congratulations to those who are with us from this morning, who followed the entire <laughs> studies of the day. Congratulations, thank you. Thank you, Nathalie de Caniv. Thank you for this very, very interesting day. Uh, glad to announce that we will publish a study from this day what is publicly uh, possible to write, of course, with the Fondation Robert Schumann I'm representing today. So thank you very much. See you soon and uh, have a nice evening and nice day tomorrow. Thank you.